Did we all just watch Windows start to die? I am David Gortz. Joining me is Matt Baxter Reynolds of ZDNet's Post PC Developments. This is Better Know a Blogger. Hey there, Matt. Hey, David. How are you doing? All right. Are you okay? We just heard a crash in the middle of the uh, the intro segment. Oh, no. No, everything's fine. Okay, good. <laughs> so, um, you are a ZDNet blogger, and uh, you recently wrote a, an article that asks the question, if we've just seen Windows begin its death spiral, do you truly think that sit at a desk computing can ever die? Right. So, yes. Interesting. Uh, no, I don't think sitting at your desk computing will ever die. So this is really, I'm really invested in this idea of death of the PC, but what I mean by that is um, if you take the total universe of computing that we're all going to do as individuals going forward, much less of that is going to be done as a focused work activity on a PC. You know, there's far more people who will be down the shops, pulling out a smartphone, having a look at Facebook, doing Instagram, uh, watching Netflix on their iPads, etc., if you think about that trend globally, what it means is that what we think about in terms of traditional PC applications, as in focused work activities, um, and I normally take work to mean uh, this is either something you're being paid to do, it's studying, or it's a hobby that's made a bit better by having a PC available, will just become less typical. So you'll, be able, you'll, you'll find more and more people who will go, well, actually, I've got a smartphone. That does my email. It does my Facebook. It does my web browsing. I'm happy. I don't need a PC. Um, but there's always going to be people, particularly technologists, who um, find some value in having a PC. So it's not that uh, Windows is going to start to die per se. It's more that it is, in the, in, the, in the immediate to medium term, become more of a niche activity within that total compute universe. So do you think that that's going to be something that is therefore sustainable for companies like Microsoft, for example, to continue to invest? Or do you think that really this becomes the sort of economic business model for Linux and the monolithic operating system companies are on their way out. Yeah, so um, this was actually, the original idea I had for that, for that piece that you've spoken about at the beginning was um, different to, to how it worked out. Because it's kind of, if you think about, if you, if you follow that, that pattern naturally from you start with Microsoft being the company is today, and if you go out 20 or 30 years and they become something more like IBM or something like a top-tier consultancy firm, does it actually make sense for that sort of firm to, um, sorry, for the clients of that firm to be investing in systems which are based on closed operating systems, so kind of uh, and closed, system, uh, closed and proprietary systems? It sort of makes more sense that you behave more like IBM does. Now, I know IBM has its own proprietary products, but they've really gone heavily after open source they really base all their systems that they're going to implement people on open standards. And that's very against where Microsoft is. So this was really then got spun into the idea of, of um, have we just started to witness Windows start to die? Because if you if they're not going to do, if Windows isn't making much sense in the post PC world in consumer land, and Windows starts to not make much sense in the enterprise space, actually, is Windows going to go on that much longer? I mean, if you think about it, Windows is going to end at some point anyway. If you think 200 years out, there's no way we're using something like we're using today. But where, where, do, we start to, where do we start to draw the line? Well, let's play with that for a second then. Um, I haven't asked this question of others, so I'll, I'll ask it of you. Mm. Um, 200 years out. What is, I mean, what is computing like? 200 years ago, you know, um, our countries had you know, just fought a war. Um, but, and, and by the way, you're, you're where in located? Oh, uh, the UK. So you're in the UK. Uh, we're about in the UK. Uh, at the moment, I'm in Suffolk. Okay, and I'm down here in the middle of central Florida, just south of Cape Canaveral. And 
We're doing this, by the way, you know, uh, this is a live connection. I mean, 10 years ago, this would have been impossible. Even with rented satellite time, it would have been prohibitive. Yeah. Um, yeah. but you know, 200 years ago, we were, we were just finishing, uh, a war between nations. Um, you know, people were, we were all agrarian societies, you know, the fastest vehicle around was a ship with, 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 with sails. What are, yeah. what, what are we going to be doing? And I know this is an unfair question, but you know, Hey, speculate, what are we doing in 200 years? What's, what's the, you know, assuming that we don't have a po post-apocalyptic situation and we make it. You yeah. know, are, are we all in the Starship Enterprise or, you know, is computing, you know, little tablets? Star Trek got it kind of wrong. So what do you think? Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I'm glad, actually really glad you asked that. So um, what the, the way that I tend to look at the computing industry is that you have these um, phases. So you have these eras which go in, in about 13-year phases. So you start with mainframes, go to mini computers, go to uh, microcomputer PC, go to internet connected PC, and now we're going to post PC. And if you, if you work all that out and you take the key products, so you end up with the IBM mainframe, I can't remember, the, um, the PDP 8 or 10, which I can't remember necessarily, the IBM PC 5150, Windows 95, and then um, the iPhone slash iPad. They sort of delineate those separate areas. If we now think the iPad is a few years old, probably about 10 years left of post PC, what happens then? So, I know we're trying to get 200 years out. We obviously can't do that in 15-year increments. But after um, what I think we're, we're going to look at after post-PC is something like human-computer relationships, which is where we have less of... Um, we develop more of a relationship with the computers that we have. So Siri is a good example of this. Um, Siri isn't necessarily interesting because of what it does. It's more interesting in the fact that it learns context. So it's like... Well, I, I know who your spouse is, I know who your friends are, I know where you go and I know where you work. And actually Google now goes in this direction as well. Um, so that will probably take us, you know, we'll start doing that in anger for 10 years, then we'll go uh, 15 years of doing that. Then we start to get, well, what happens next? And if you draw a line between post-PC computing, which is about relationship-centric or relationship -centric computing, I'll come back to your point about how we're actually managing to have this relationship or this connection in a sec. When... If we say, okay, well, post-PC technology seems to be about making um, relationships, the way we manage relationships more efficient in terms of being technology, we can apply to our social networks. And I don't mean social networks like Facebook. I mean social networks as in you're born and you know nobody, then you know your parents, then you know your friends, then et cetera, et cetera. And throughout your whole life, you, you build up this social network within your mind. And now post-PC technology seems to be... Um, all about building efficiency within that network. So we take post-PC, we do human-to-human -human relationships through that, we then do human-computer relationships as the next phase, and then perhaps the, the, the relationships after that is computer-computer relationships. So an example of that might be that I can manage, I like using Twitter, but I can manage a network of a certain size, but in theory, if I could create some sort of avatar or, um, or bot of me that knew what was important to me and what was important to my life, I could put that into, 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 a, into a computer network and it was able to have computer-computer relationships with, say, your bot or other people's bots. And again, drive efficiency within that social network and bring the opportunities together. Because the one thing that's sort of a constant throughout all of this computing history we have is that they, um, the technology generally makes things work better for the individuals who are involved. So, I mean, I've got... I've numerous examples of professional stuff, which is easy to talk about the personal stuff, um, that we're, which have been dramatically improved just by the fact that technology is there as opposed to us only having telegrams or fax or actually having to physically go up and, and talk to somebody. So, um, yeah, I, you know, we're obviously 200 years out isn't too difficult, but even if we go out to 30 years, it's still pretty sci-fi. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Um, that, that's, that's absolutely the case. And since you talked a little bit about, about professional, why don't we do a little bit about talking about you, because this is Better Know a Blogger, and we'll come back to this topic throughout the discussion because we want to kind of get a feel for, for who you are and, and, and what your background is. So um, let's jump back to the basics. Tell us about your background, how you got to where you are now, and how'd you come to ZDNet? Okay, so um, I started writing software when I was eight. Um, my dad was a, a computer consultant. He was one of the first... Um, sort of generation computer consultants working in the UK. Uh, I then got a, a job with a software company as uh, a programmer. That company moved out to Phoenix, Arizona, so I went with them and did that. 
for a few years. Um, and when I came back, I wa- I'd, al- I'd always wanted to do some writing. I always wanted to write technical books. So I, I got a contract with um, Rocks Press to write a book called Beginning E-Commerce. And the general idea of that book was uh, e-business and e-commerce was really interesting. Um, but we want, I wanted to be able to show people, well, actually building an e-commerce solution from scratch is really easy. You don't, it doesn't need to cost a lot of money. You can do it with, in that book, was Classic ASP and uh, BB6 and SQL Server 7, I think. Um, so then I did that for Rocks. I did a whole load of other books over a period of time. I did a website called .NET 24 7, um, which was trying to do community building around .NET development when .NET first came out. I then ran my own software business for a time. Uh, and then a couple of years ago, I started getting to using Twitter. And through that, I met the, uh, the editor of The Guardian in the UK. I did some uh, blogging for him, which was fantastic fun. And I found that I really loved it. Um, through that, I ended up making friends with uh, Mary Jo Foley, who was we know from ZDNet. And um, through that, I then managed to uh, get a, a position writing for ZDNet, which is um, where I do uh, which is where I do all the, all the sort of the, the industry-based writing. So I, I do that. I also do day-to-day normal consultancy work um, and uh, writing books. Well, we're very, very glad to have you uh, at CDNet. I, I think I, I tweeted at one point that you're becoming one of the must-read bloggers on the network. So I, I really appreciate your stuff. Oh, no, so thank you. You, you, you talked about consulting and, and writing books. I know mm. you're working on a book that now that's, that's due out, what, September? Do you want to tell us about yeah. it? Uh, yeah, so the book I'm doing at the moment is called Death of the PC. So it's... Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, and the idea of the book is really, the, the stuff that we've, we've spoken about in the first few minutes of this interview, it's, it's all about that sort of idea. So it's it looks to um, define what post-PC actually is. It looks at products in the market that make some sense um, in terms of post-PC. Then it looks how people use it at home, how people use it at work, what happens to um, the sort of the classic enterprise market, um, and then how people can benefit from that. And then the last chapter is actually also what we spoke about in the first bit of the book as well, which is um, where what happens after post-PC, or what might happen after post-PC. Well, that sounds really, really interesting. I've been, I've been really playing with this question of whether we're post-PC or really that the App Store model changed everything. You know, because we, we actually had tablet PCs. I had a tablet PC that was slightly larger than my iPad somewhere in 2001. It was an Acer that broke every time I used it, but it was a tablet yeah. PC. You yeah. know, it, it ran XP with tablet extensions. But the App Store, the ability for random users to just download quickly, install quickly, try out, and the price point compressing from, you know, $49 to $3 changes, I think, everything, don't you think? Yeah, so the app stores are interesting, and it's, it's um, coming back to the book, when I first planned the book, I, I, in my head, I thought, I'm going to have to talk quite a lot about ecosystems and, and app stores, and actually, when in the book, there's only a, about 1,000 words, uh, 60,000, which are about ecosystems. So, what the app stores actually give you is more of um, one of the attributes of post-PC computing. So I break post-PC down into seven attributes, which I've now got to remember because I don't have it written down, I probably won't. So, one <laughs> of them, so they're, they're, um, they always have to be uh, available. So they have to be around you at all times, which a smartphone is fantastically good at, being, at doing that, not only because it's tiny, but also because over the past 20 years, we've got used to, as a society, always having our phones with us. And tablets are... A different form of portability on that. So they have to be um, always available, always connected to the internet, which means more that their function is less good if they're not connected, if they don't have an internet connection. It has to be relationship centric, meaning that what they do most of the time is, um, is connect you into the people and the things that you love. Uh, they have to have uh, low cognitive loading, which means they have to be very simple. That's the first app store point. They have to have low intimidation and full trust, which is the other app store point. Um, they have to be, I remember the last year, which is lucky. They have to be monochronistic rather than polychronistic. Monochronistic means one thing at a time as opposed to polychronistic, which is multiple things at a time. Um, so this pattern you have with, with post-PC devices where you have apps that you jump in and out of and everything's siloed away is, and everything's just one thing at a time is, is deliberate and why they work. 
PCs are polychronistic because they're designed for focused work where you need to aggregate and collect complex information together. So I need to see my emails, I need to see these web pages, I need to see Word, I need to see IM, because I need all this around polychronistically at the same time because I'm trying to trying to combine and compile things together. That's really interesting. I'm going to interrupt you there for a second because I because I'm actually yeah. doing that right now. I'm going to see if I can do this switch for a sec. Yes. Uh, let's see if this works. Hang on one second, folks. There we go. Okay, so this is the studio. Now, I'm running uh, a Mac, which is running three or four different programs. It's running Skype. It's running something called Boinks TV. It's running something called Keyboard Magician. Uh, it's running Cam Twist. It's running all of these things. But I also have on the teleprompter over here an iPad, which is only reflecting this chunk of video up here so I can actually talk straight at the screen. Okay. I've got an iPhone here, which is giving us the cute little sound for your book title. Lovely. And then I'm controlling the thing with the iPad, which is also dedicated to a specific purpose. So yep. I have three... Oh, let me bring you back here. Let's see if this works now. Um, I have three dedicated purpose machines that are, are really serving an individual purpose and hopefully will bring us back. Come on now. Yep. There we go. Uh, that are, are serving very specific purposes. The iPad is the control panel. The PC is the prompter that I'm looking into right... I mean, the, the, the other iPad is the prompter I'm looking into. The iPhone is the sound generator. Yeah. And then the PC is doing 10 different things, 16 gigabytes of RAM, doing all sorts of stuff, the PC in this case being the Mac. So I do yeah. see what you mean. I mean, I've turned some of these into devices and then others into systems. So neat concept. Yeah, you've got to, you, I mean, but, you, but you're at work, yeah? So this is yeah, a work thing yeah, you're this doing. Is work. This, this is complicated. You, you know, we could do this just with one iPad. You know, we could have an iPad each and do it over Skype. It just wouldn't be particularly professional. Right. But the job we've done there looks bad, which is great. I wish I had one. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the interesting jump to the death of the PC is you've got, I mean, you're using four iOS devices there, aren't you? Uh, Wait, no, sorry, you're using three iOS and one Mac. Three iOS devices and a Mac, and it's interesting because I'm mostly a, a Windows user, but the reason I'm using the Mac is specifically because I'm able to do the background that you're looking at through yeah. something called Boinks TV and Cam Twist, which wasn't available on the PC. So I actually chose the systems based on what it's available on. Yeah. Um, you know, I want to get I want to get back to your stuff, but um, they they really connect because this is a case, and this is why I keep thinking about it from a professional point of view versus a personal point of view. You know, what I did here was attempting to take a quarter million dollar to a half a million dollar TV studio and bring it down to something around five grand yeah. um, using off-the-shelf technology, um, which is what PCs do really well. Um, yes. You know, on the other hand, our friends, my dad, um, our neighbors love the, the iPad or the Nexus because they can read on it and watch TV on it and, you know, watch Hulu or whatever it is that they do. And that's what they do with it. So my, yeah. my, my looking at this issue of post-PC is really, are we looking at the fact that PCs are not, that the PCs never really should have been commercial, uh, a consumer, excuse me, and are really, we're seeing the split of this technology from industrial professional to oh, consumer yeah. in a big no, way. No, no, I'm fat you brought that up, actually, because that's really... Um, really a sort of an interest, interesting point in the, in the evolution of how we got there. So the way that um, you can define what PC is, is it's PCs came from, uh, PCs are devices that drive commercial efficiency. So it's, I need to manage my cash flow better, so I will buy a PC and I will have run some accounting software on it, my cash flow will be better, the board will be happy, my business will be healthier. So in most, so the whole world of, of where we took um, mainframes, mini computers, PCs is all commercial efficiency. But what we needed as a society were these tools that let us um, do the social networking side better. And that meant we needed uh, personal email, we needed to be able to get a website, so did web forums and early uh, blogs, and then we started to develop version two social networking services like Twitter and Facebook and um, Instagram and Tumblr and so on and so forth. But while we were doing that, before post-PC became a thing, we were co-opting equipment from the world of commercial efficiency. So your HP laptop doesn't look significantly different to how an HP server does in a rack sitting somewhere that someone's bought because they're running a multi-billion dollar business on it. Um, 
so yeah, it, it's that the schism with, which has happened has really been because people who were normal people were like, no, actually, what, what, what we really want the market to provide for us are devices which are just simpler, they've got less intimidation, I don't have to worry about them, they're not going to embarrass me, they're not going to cost me money. Um, you know, I, I, need, I need these closed off, secure ecosystems, which is where your point about the app stores come from. So the app stores are more important because of what they give you. What they give you is control and reduction in intimidation and reduction in the surface area of, of how you can get embarrassed by someone um, uh, stealing your stuff or, or putting, putting your stuff online or, or whatever because of the security problems you have on Windows, particularly. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's and then when we look at what technology is tend to talk about, it's kind of like, well, this is this, this doesn't make any sense. We split like this. It all needs to come back together again, which is why Windows and Microsoft, which is why Microsoft is struggling because it's like, well, hang on, we had everything great going on here in terms of how the PC world worked and our commercial efficiency stuff, and that was great, and you can do all this social networking stuff on it, but people don't seem to want to. Why are people buying all these tablets and smartphones? We've got to close the gap. We've got to bring it back in again. And for me, I think, you know, society tells us that doesn't happen. Once an idea is out there, you can't really ever get an idea to go back in this little box again. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, I don't really want to turn this into an attacking Microsoft thing. We might <laughs> get some more gentle points later, but it's, it's, there's some interesting ideas around Office not yeah. really fitting this model at all, but being desperately important to Microsoft. Yeah, it's it, absolutely. And one of the things that, that I don't know if you're aware of, you had a little bit of a sound breakup as we were talking. But okay. again, we're looking at, at, you know, I mean, the fact is, is we're you and I are talking live across an ocean while putting yeah. this together. And we have a tiny little bit of sound breakup. It's astonishing. So, yeah, but, the, but the technology is not the important thing. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut across, yeah. but the technology isn't important. The fact is that you and I would never have met right. had it not been for post-PC. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and be, because it's relationship centric, it enables, the, the point about the efficiency is, Efficiency in social networks is it stops it being about who you meet down the pub or who you go to work with. It's like, well, actually, I can find people I can connect with wherever and whenever they are in the world. So now my social network is, um, like your social network is, it's it, a lot of the people watching this will have the same style social network now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's broad in terms of interest. It's broad in terms of connection, ge geography, time zones. It's, it's, it's amazing stuff. I mean, the technology is great that it's sort of keeping us do it. Um, but we're only building that technology. That technology is only being demanded because of the of the emotional win, the sociological win that's coming from the fact that that people in our position can have relationships, whereas before they didn't. That makes total sense. So, what's your what's your primary work environment like? Do you work from the office or from home? What's your typical workday like? Uh, yeah. Okay. So my work environment is whatever desk I can find or client site, um, and sort of similarly at. At, at home, I'd sort of reproduce that model as well. So I've got um, each client site that I have, I have a monitor and a keyboard and a mouse that I leave there um, and a little laptop stand. And I use a MacBook Pro um, that I take between the different sites. So I do effectively everything on that. So when I, um, I wake up, like a lot of us, I will typically check my email on my phone um, and Twitter. And then I will uh, typically try and do a bit of blogging in the morning, go and do the client site, uh, go and do the client work, and then in the evening look at doing uh, more blogging and writing the books as well. So I, I'm also doing a, a sci-fi book at the moment. Um, yeah, which is always sort of something I've always wanted to write novels. So I've just started doing that, and I'm 80 percent of the way through the first draft of that, which is a different type of writing, quite challenging. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I love to write. It's the thing that I really, really like doing is writing things down. So it's um, I try and do that around around all the client work. Basically. Well, I am I'm very excited to see the science fiction book when you're done with it. That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Do you, very, do you want to share be... with us a little nugget? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this odd fascination with hyphenated names. What's the, is there a story there? We have three or four bloggers on ZDNet with hyphenated names, and I'm, I've always been curious about it. Yeah, um, I got married, and we um, combined our names. Really? That's kind of interesting. Yeah, uh, it, seemed, um, it seemed fairer. I didn't really think why we had this rule. I mean, I understand where, this, where the tradition comes from. I didn't understand. I, I thought it was nice to change the tradition and actually say, well, actually, you know, darling, if you're going to change your name, then I will change my name as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> so let's, let's go on to um, some blogging questions um, as I continue. So... 
Do you mind talking about like the roughly the percentage of income that comes from blogging versus your other activities? And and you you talked about consulting being your other activities. Are are you making a, a living with blogging? Are you mostly consulting and using blogging as a a way to get your your name out there? Where does blogging fit into your sort of economic model? Yeah. So I make um, uh, effectively all of I make all of the money I need to live on from the consultancy. Um, and then the uh, writing stuff um, is additional to that. So I forgot the second part of your question, actually. Just in terms of, uh, you know, how does it fit with your other activities? In other words, are you using blogging more as a marketing thing, or you, you mentioned that you love writing, so, so there's also some amount of, of getting your, yourself out there because you want to write, I would assume. Yeah, I think um, at the moment... I only write because it's something I want to do. I don't really do it to get anything out of it in terms of the, in terms of the sort of in, in terms of getting consultancy leads or anything or, or the, the work from that. I think it's helpful when you talk to people and say, "Well, I've written the Guardian, I do books, and so on and so forth." That's always helpful. Um, but at this point, no, actually, there's something I never thought about. The, the only I only do it because I enjoy it. I think it's the reason why is it's quite transformative is that the, the way that I think about my work is, is two intersecting axes. So the stuff I do for clients, which is, which is your classic, it's a business case. It's, we've got to deliver some enterprise system. We've got people who are got to be trained up, invested, blah, blah, blah. And then cutting through that is the, um, the thing about the, the sociological side. So, and I think of myself as a technology sociologist, which, um, and the way that I look at it is that it is, the only really interesting thing about our industry is how technology changes people and how society changes as a result of that. Um, and the writing lets me spend an awful lot of time exploring those ideas. And that's the bit that interests me. Well, I'm going to say this without switching screens because I've got the screen where I want it for the moment. But what exactly is a technology sociologist? Well, glad you asked that because we all need to be technology sociologists. This is the biggest challenge that we have now is um, a lot of the post-PC movement can be informed from uh, a thing called um, ubiquitous computing or Ubicomp. Now, Ubicomp was developed at Xerox Park, which I would imagine everybody listening to this will know is also where the original PC was conceived of. Um, and uh, there was a gentleman there who sadly died very young called Mark Weiser who um, came up with, well, okay, we now, his position was, well, we now understand how, the, how a personal computing device works at work. And this was in the 80s, I, I think he did this. Um, what happens if we look at how computers affect people's lives? And that's where ubiquitous computing came around. And the idea of ubiquitous computing is that it's everywhere around you all the time. So if you go back to my precepts of post-PC, it's always available, always connected. What he also spoke about a lot was the idea that this was basically a sociological change. So it was about how technology can help change, can change society. So everything that happens with post-PC has to be regarded, and everything that's happening in our industry now, has to be regarded in terms of how it's affecting people's lives, the relationships, um, it's social anthropology, it's sociology, there's a whole load of other ologies that it all, it all ties down to. But the, the important things for technologists like me and like you is, is that if you don't understand that this stuff isn't about um, how many cycles you can get out of a CPU or how long the battery lasts, or the battery, it, it's about um, what actually is happening to an individual when they're sharing something on Instagram, what happens well, there's also the light and darkness as well, yeah. So that's a sharing, sharing something nice on Instagram and having your friends like it is great. But what also happens in terms of increases in, in uh, the vectors you can get bullied by online. Um, what happens when society is changing so that so that there are people who are who are much more privileged in terms of access to technology than have to others and those sorts of things. So it's it's we all have to become technology sociologists going forward. Otherwise, we're just basically not going to understand what's happening. And the people who are going to get left behind in our industry are those who don't don't understand what it's doing to people. Why people love it. Why people enjoy it. I mean, again, I don't want to bash Microsoft. It's just a shame we're a bit of a straw man, easy straw man to pull down like this. But the reason why Windows the Windows 8 project, as I call it, with Windows RT and Surface and so on, is failing is because as an organization, they don't seem to have employees that understand why people love their iPads. The simplest thing they could have done is gone, 
and they're selling an awful lot of these iPads and they look really, really good. But we should probably just copy it, which is really what Google has done. Um, Microsoft hasn't done that because they don't understand a, a grassroots level and an employee by employee rank and file level what people love about their iPads. So they just end up imposing the corporate strategy. And this is one of Microsoft's classic problems we often talk about, which is that they build products for themselves, which is great if you think about if you think about enterprise, because it's like we need a really good database. Well, we're a really big company and we're really good at building databases, so let's give you that. It's much less obvious how you do that. Um, how you how you manage that model when you don't really understand what is happening to someone when they're sharing something on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Um, interestingly, Windows Phone seems to be doing better than their tablet strategy, and I think I'm starting to put that down to an understanding that um, the, the engineers at the rank and file level understand what smartphones are really doing for them. You know, the, the guys out there have got Android and iPhone and Windows Phone who are really understanding and, and loving it and making it part of their lives of being able to use that to make better products. So that's really the that in combination with um, the fact that Bulmer is sort of shift, uh, Steve Bulmer is shifting the structure of the organisation to allow change to happen. Mm -hmm. It's really why I have any faith at all that anything positive is going to come out of Microsoft in um, over the next few years, they, they just need to do it very quickly. So, is your background at all in in uh, sociology or psychology, or did you just realize that this is really a key to to the future of, of technology? No, I guess I guess I've always had an amateur interest mm. in in that sort of side, and then it's just it's it's whatever's collided in our industry has kind of created this perfect storm for me, which is which is exactly the stuff that I'm interested at at exactly a point when I was actually very bored. Got it. So. Um, and then had the opportunities come up, so it's like, okay, well, this is this is sort of great for me. So, how do you handle your daily social networking chores? Do you like hand post to individual services? Do you use a tool? Do you post all day? Do you just do uh, a chunk of stuff in the morning? How do how do you deal with the that as a chore? Yeah, I don't really think of it as a chore. <laughs> um, I am a bit into Twitter, probably a bit too much. So I just I um, have TweetDeck hanging around, and I use I use TweetDeck a lot. I've been trying to get into Google Plus, um, and I'm doing a piece uh, in a few weeks called 30 Days of Google Plus, which is um, me trying to understand what it's actually for. And I'm sort of starting to understand that, actually starting to enjoy it and starting to engage with it. Um, the, but, but yeah, it's, it's um, I mean, I regard email as social networking as well, mm -hmm. so it's sort, of, it, it's sort of ubiquitous within what I do uh, and how I am and how I, how I interact with that. So. But it's, it's being, uh, I, I guess also a lot of the viewers here will, will be able to relate to this as well, is when you're isolated as a consultant and you're bouncing around itinerantly from some client site to client site to client site, actually having a good social, digital social network available to you is really helpful. I mean, I've got loads of work and stuff about that, but it's also nice just to be connected with people when you're effectively isolated in, in different client environments. That makes sense. And what do you do about, like, uh, Facebook? How do you deal with... Uh with that, do you use it for only close friends, or do you open it to everyone? Do you use fan um, pages? I actually don't use Facebook. I do have Facebook pages, and I've been I've got an automated tool that takes the stuff that I write and pushes it through onto Facebook. It's Facebook I struggle with because I think it it's the sociological side is very subtle, and and it's got to be subtly managed. And Twitter's very very good at, at letting you manage um, the subtleties of how you relate to people. Facebook always strikes me as too blunt, so. The way that I tend to think about it is that if, um, this is a slightly wacky idea, but if you think about our, in, uh, our society as being a kind of a gestalt, semi-conscious entity that's able to build technology that lets us become better as, as a society, which, is, which you think has happened all the time. Yeah, so we think about technology as being high technology, but the wheel is technology, full field crop rotation is technology, a hospital is technology, or so a healthcare system is. Um, I think Maybe your healthcare system. Well, yeah, but you know what I'm saying. It's, it's kind of it, it's it's a complex set of systems, which which enable us to sort of stay alive longer, which enable us to build better technologies and such, right. et cetera. So yeah, and have better lives. And all technology basically works like that. So it's kind of did we kind of throw up through society? Facebook, it's an interesting choice of words, but it's sort of a V1 tool. I think it's too blunt. So the way that I see Facebook happening, uh, what will happen is that something will kind of want to do the close friends and family, the, the network of people you know stuff, stuff will be done more subtly in a, in a sort of another tool that will replace it. 
it's kind of interesting that you you talk about Facebook as sort of a blunt tool, and mm. yet Twitter is the 140 character limit, which really kind of isolates the kind of discussions that you can have. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand sort of where you see the strengths of Twitter versus the weaknesses of Facebook. And I'm, I'm really curious from a technology sociologist point of view, how you see those as different. Yeah, okay. So I think it's the 140 characters is, is, a, technical, is a technical limitation, but it also it dramatically changes the nature of the communication. When I've been looking at Google+, Plus, this is something which is interesting. It's Google+, Plus struggles. So we talk about Google+, Plus more than Facebook, because sort of, it's more in my mind, and it's, okay. it's more obvious to me. Um, Google+, Plus always struggles in terms of interaction. And I think the reason why is because when you, when you get a discussion going on Google+, Plus, it's kind of like someone will write back 500 words, and it's like, I just can't parse that. I can't manage. That's not really what I'm in here for. You know, but Twitter doesn't have that problem. Um, Twitter is also, there's also an interesting thing about Twitter is that in the people who are successful on Twitter are funny. So people who really make it work use, don't use humor a lot, but are able to use um, humor as kind of a social grease, which, it, it's, which is interesting. And I think that's got a lot to do with the, with the message. You have to kind of get a message across, which is, um, I've got something interesting and I've got something to say. But I've got to be very spare with it. I've, I've, got to, I've got to be able to do it in a very short way. And it enables... In, okay, no, I'm really sort of thinking about this one, sort of struggling with some ideas. The other thing, I, someone wrote ages and ages ago, and I can't find who did it, describing Twitter as society's nervous system. So the idea of Twitter is that people throw out ideas and um, they get amplified as, as nerve signals within this massive, connect, massive connected network. So the ideas effectively become qualified by whether or not they reach a certain mass of, of volume. Um, within, I'm slightly stretching around here, but sorry. Um, within that, great. Think, keep it up. Yeah, no, I think, so there's that social, so ideas propagate out, and then it's kind of like, well, actually, I think this is idea, and then, and then people kind of go, well, I've understood that idea because it's been very succinct because you've had to fit in 140 characters. I now have to get my acceptance of that very succinct as well. And it enables these ideas to flow and work around at a very, very fast rate. And then, of course, you're trying to connect with people and actually you have to be likable and funny because you've only really got enough space to kind of say, you know, I agree with you and I, 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 agree with you and I like you and I, I, this, is, this is a positive idea for me. Why don't you come and join me in this? Or actually, I don't agree and that's a bit... I've got a problem with that. Um, it, there, there is Twitter really only works because it's so it's so short. Because I think it enables a velocity of ideas and interconnectedness, which um, which is tied into this idea about social networking services being about efficiency of building your own social network and learning. I think. So it's, we've se we've seen something recently where the 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 rate of retweets to follows has changed in the past year or so. I read, I, I wish I could remember the source. I read it yesterday or today that okay. in the past year, a vastly larger number of people are favoriting, but not retweeting. In other words, they're not fueling that nervous system with, with their tweets. If they okay. find something they like, they're favoriting it. It stays with themselves and they can go reference it, but not take it on elsewhere. Um, I hadn't heard that. That would seem, that seems counterintuitive. That it, sounds like a, it does, a, isn't it? Yeah, I guess that might be a, a complex system self-regulate themselves, don't they? So that, that, that's probably um, a, an example of self-regulation within the network. That's, that something is changing with its nature because, um, because it's going to reach a certain size mm. or complexity. That's kind of know, interesting. That's my guess. Yeah, that's kind of interesting. Okay, yeah. so let's, let's move on to another sort of... Um, Workman-like part of the topic here, in in you know, a lot of the people who who listen to Better Know Our Blogger are, are trying to learn how to do this well. So um, I'm going to ask okay. you another one, which is, how do you manage contacts? Do you use a separate CRM system? Do you categorize your contacts or structure them? Do you dump them in something? Are you something like eGrabber to grab your information? It's funny. I was thinking about this the other day because I, for years and years and years, I would religiously maintain a contact list on, on and I was desperate not to lose it. Um, over the past few years, I have effectively just not bothered. So I think anyone that I tend to talk to tends to come in with my email, and I would tend to go dig them and find them out from that. 
Um, but it's not uncommon for me to go, I really need to find, especially on Twitter, if I've spoken to someone a couple of times, I go, God, I really need to talk to that person again. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> I don't know who they are. Um, so, yeah, I probably need, it's probably a good prompt from that question for me to try and sort sort my own life out a bit with that. I think I used to use a CRM ages ago. Um, but now it's, it's yeah, it, it's more, I think, I think it's probably just a natural function of being more, using social networks more because you tend to be more in contact with these people anyway so they become more rather than having a couple of thousand addresses in, a, in Outlook which is what I used to have it's more I've got I've got a couple of thousand addresses in Outlook but the, the X number of people I talk to on a daily basis are probably more than people I need to be talking to so do you think in the, in the this this view of of the death of the PC do you think mm. technologies like CRM are also going down with it Well, yeah, okay. Well, uh, enterprise CRM, no, 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 no. They should get they should get stronger in the CRM, really, because CRMs. What, one of the one of the things that people don't really um, talk about much is what's happening with post PC devices in terms of how they're used in business. So, mm -hmm. it's what um, if you apply the baseline principle of post PC, which is relationship centric computing, what and relationships happen in work. It should be that you can use post PC more to do um, to, to, to do relationships more effectively within the work environment, either intra company or extra company. And CRM has got relationship baked right into it. So I would imagine that in terms of enterprise CRM, especially integration with social networking services, uh, should actually be quite a healthy area to invest in going forward in post PC. So we see we see enterprise on one side, right? Yeah. We see consumers on the other side. And and enterprise, you know, if somebody's going to come into work and sit at a desk, I mean, when I used to have a pile of employees, I would have loved to buy a $200 Chromebook instead of a, you know, $1,500 PC that required somebody to set it up. Um, yeah. Just because it would have been, it would have done just as much as I needed at the time for, for I guess, 80 or 90% of my employees. Mm. Uh, but today we've got, you know, the, the large company and, and then we've got individuals, but there's this entire realm of, let's just call them individual contributors, consultants, contractors, bloggers, developers, whatever, who yeah. are, are, you know, two or three people companies. Um, do you see them gravitating more towards just living off of their phone or gravitating more towards PC setups or someplace in between? Where, where does this small you know, tiny uh, organization or, or individual sole proprietorship or mini corporate professional corporation go in a post-PC era to get their job done? Yeah, okay. So what sort of tools do they use? Maybe, uh, maybe the tools aren't important. I think it's, I think what, what happens, uh, you, you sort of, yeah, this collides right into the bit of chapter five of the book, which I'm just about <laughs> to start, start planning, which is like, oh, okay. So <laughs> this is going to be a very on the hoof. Um, what we, we know that we can sort of say, well, there's going to be some there's going to be some vectors where we can bring relationship centric computing more into into the work environment through post PC. But then we've got other questions like, well, why do we even need to be in an office all the time anyway? Um, we've now got lives which are so complex in terms of um, you know the, the, there is the nuclear family has kind of gone away, divorce rates, and, and in terms of how families split up and recombine and then individuals split up and recombine gets really complex. Everyone's life is much more complicated. Do we need to be in the office all the time? Do we, when we're in the office, do we actually need desks? I mean, the desk only exists because we needed Atom machines to put on it and then we use typewriters to put on it and then we use PCs to put on it. So do, do we even need those environments? Um, what about BYOD? You know, I, I think a lot about working, what, where a professional works in terms of, um, the, the, the work boundaries, both in, in a temporal sense and in terms of a physical sense, these, those are all changing all the time anyway. So, um, you know, could I, come, coming back to your point about the tools, if I only did writing all day, could I, could I just have an iPad? Yes. Could I just use a Chromebook? Yes. But I do a specialist software development job, so I need a PC because it's a specialist job. Um, but I think the, the changes that we'll see will be much more, it's, it could be a challenge for employers because they're used to buying in the UK, you know, they buy 37 and a half hours a week for X amount of salary per year. Mm -hmm. um, it's how does, how does technology change that? 
or more to the point, not really, how does, how does technology support the fact that as a society we need that to be a bit different? It's now, it's now very difficult to get everybody into the office all the time and not have to worry about babysitters or childcare or, or health issues or whatever. And it's, we could probably do with being more sensitive to that sort of thing. And we can now use technology to do that. And I think that, that's probably the more, uh, the more interesting part from a technology sociology's point of view. But again, from the tools point of view, it's, it's, you know, there's more options now. This is why post PC is happening. It's, there were, we had to use these PCs which were co-opted from commercial efficiency, the world of commercial efficiency in order to do stuff outside of work. We can now use smartphones, tablets, or PCs, or Chromebooks, or Macs. Well, yeah. Mac is PC, but, um, or whatever comes next, or so on and so forth. That makes, that makes sense. So how do you manage all the information and resources you deal with, like articles and web pages you might want to reference later for blog posts? Um, do you save links and bookmarks? Do you use something like Evernote or Zotero? Do you just wing it? Yeah, I probably couldn't survive without Evernote, to be honest. Um, that thing is just fantastic. I mean, it is, uh, Evernote is fascinating from a post-PC perspective anyway because it's possibly the first great example we have of a post-PC tool. You know, it's the first... It's cloud-based. It runs on absolutely everything. It aggregates, collect information together freely. It's simple to use. There's no intimidation. It's just, it's just an absolutely fabulous piece of software. There are people who use Evernote, I'm sure, who can really make it sing. I just use it as a dumping ground, but I use it each and every day on basically every device I have. Um, another way I track information is normally the information I get comes from Twitter, so I just tag the tw tag the Twitter as a favorite. Um, it's interesting. It just occurred to me that's actually public, so you could go through and find what I found was interesting on Twitter just by looking at my favorites. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's it's really in terms of inbound information. Then if I need to capture something, I'll capture it in Evernote or or as a Twitter favorite or as a bookmark if I'm absolutely desperate. Um, uh, but yeah, I guess it's really the information dissemination that's the more interesting thing because you know the, the job that you and I do is really about getting information out there, and it's, yeah. it's some of that is okay. What do we create? You know, we're commenting, but we're also curating by retweeting stuff back into the network and sharing on Google Plus or LinkedIn or whatever as well. So yeah, there's there's the information flow definitely goes two ways, and and you, you're talking about um, the better know blogger side, workman like side of this. It's mm -hmm. unless you are. Uh, that's the only thing you have to do. It's you can't collect information and then not not get it out there again. You're you're continually curating and, re, and tweaking and mashing and, and re, re putting it out there. So one of the things I'm trying to do on Google Plus to understand how it works is um, I have a, a tickle list. So anything that occurs to me that might make a good CV now, I'll get off on Evernote. But then there are things which uh, are never going to make it into an article because I can only write two and a half a month, two and a half a week basically. Um, so I'll put that out on Google. I'm starting to try and put that on Google Plus as a discussion. So it's kind of like, what do you think about this? Um, which is another way of getting the same information out there, but also engaging more directly and bringing, bringing comments back in. But again, that's, that's the job we do. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, yeah. So you're, you've talked about Google Plus a few times, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring this in for a landing in a couple minutes. But... Um, <laughs> Where do you see Google Plus in all of this? Are you still trying to figure that out? Do you think, I mean, first off, do you think Google Plus has a chance? Yeah, I think it probably does because although I've only been doing it for a few days, I've been, the way I started to do it was a set reminder um, in my diary to, to uh, the beginning, uh, midway through the morning is go and spend 15 minutes on Google Plus. And I thought at the end of the 30 days that might be all I'd do. I'm now finding myself in a position where I'm going, actually, I wonder if there's anything interesting out there. I wonder if, or a couple of times today I shared something on Twitter and then also put it out on Google+. Um, it is a funny beast of a thing. I've still yet got to go get my head around it, but I think it, it's, um, it will win over LinkedIn. LinkedIn's community stuff is really not working. Um, that's very old school. It's just, it's too clunky. Google Plus has, has definitely got some appropriate new shininess about it, which I think gives it legs. So now compare that, if, if and I know we're spending a lot of time on social networking, but, you know, uh, technology sociologist, and the fact is, is bloggers have to kind of live through social networking in, in ways that, you know, when I first started writing, um, that was not the case. It wasn't a two-way conversation. It was a one-way conversation. Now it's you know, a, a, a many-way conversation. Um, yep. 
so you know let's let's look at just briefly we've got LinkedIn which to me is is a resume and reference thing I, I go to LinkedIn to find out who is this person in the meeting and what's their role in their company and and that's, yeah. that's pretty much what I go there for you know mm. um Facebook is its thing Twitter is very clearly what you know the it's it's very quick dialogue that nervous system mm. would you use Google Plus instead of Facebook would you use Google Plus instead of Twitter do you use both? Do you tweet to? Do you send messages to both places? How how do you see that? Um, I haven't. I, I I've occasionally post on Google Plus, but I'll, I'll be honest. I'm I'm still forcing myself to spend 15 minutes a day on Facebook. So um, Twitter's yeah. been the place I've been most successful. Well, Twitter Twitter tends to be successful for everyone because it just it just works. Yeah. You know? um, I think it's not something you have to make work. Um, I don't think. I don't think I would ever stop using Twitter, to be honest, and, and start using Google Plus, Google Plus something else. I'm, the reason why I'm trying to do the experiment is a couple of people that I spoke to who were very smart in social social networking um, were suggesting that I should probably invest in it. And then I thought if I did it in a way that I can then share the, the results of that experiment with, with um, ZD Net readership, that would really be helpful. Um, I, I think ultimately it will come out, it will end up being a tool that I keep using. Um, I don't really know how yet. It, it, I think it might do. It might do a classic connected technological community thing better than anything else that's out there at the moment. I, I suspect that's where it will go. So one of the things I want to start um, and I've put it out there, but I haven't really started pushing it yet is um, is a Google Plus community called um, Post PC Changes Everything, which is really where. A, a more of a, a the kind of the social, the technical sociolo sociological view of, of what's happening in the industry. Um, and I want to see whether I can make that community work over these 30 days as well. Interesting. So, That's really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. So uh, going, going back to, we're, we're going to have three questions left. So the, the, the second to last one, sorry, the third from last one actually, is uh, and I'm looking down. Actually, I've got believe it or not, paper I'm using. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm amazed. Well, that's good. That's because I've got an I've got my iPad Mini, my iPad, and my my phone all used up. So I'm, I'm out. I, I could bring in the next eye, but at the moment it's paper. Um, what do you do for fun, hobbies, interests, that kind of stuff? Oh, good grief. Um, I have two very young kids, so I just I just I just entertain them. <laughs> <laughs> That'll keep you busy. Yeah. All, all right. right. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, uh, I guess I've been doing the novel for fun over the past, the past few months. That's cool. That's very, very yeah. cool. So, um, before I ask you the last question, what I want to do is give you a chance to tell our viewers, readers, anything you want to tell them, um, you know, anything that you want to pass along as a key message. Is there anything that I haven't asked that you'd like to answer or otherwise sort of share? No, I think, I think the two... The, the, the two things I, I think I'd like people to take away from this is is one, if you don't use Twitter and you're and you have to do a professional job, you should be doing Twitter. There is nothing like it for sharing information with a broad professional community, regardless of what that community is. Um, it has been an absolutely life changing technology for me. I think it, it I think it's a life changing technology for anyone who uses it. It makes you totally not isolated. It enables learning at just a, a, an enormous, unimaginable rate. Students should use it all the time. Um, it is just fantastic. And the, the other thing is if you are a, um, a workaday individual in the IT industry, um, it's, it's all about the sociology now. You've got to, you've got to get your head around how, um, you've got to get around your head around the more emotional side and the more sociological side of, of what technology is doing for people and to people. Because, because uh, just being a case of, well, it's got such and such chipset or it's got these feature points, uh, that, that has now gone. So what do you think the uh, the ten year old you would think of the you today? Oh no. <laughs> what? Um, I don't know. I think he'd probably think we were quite lucky to be able to watch whatever T V we want any time. I think you know, when I was a kid we just used to have to watch what was on three broadcast channels and eventually we had a VCR we could watch whatever and manage the video. I think I think actually if there's one bit of technology that he would look at and go this is not your question, but it's a question I'm answering. Uh, for a bit of technology to look at um, would be uh, would would be the sort of the, the video on demand thing. Just the fact that that my kids don't even know how to turn the television on, but they can watch whatever they want on Netflix on their iPads, no problem. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see if we can uh, 
move this along. There we go. Get you back. Come on. Let's see if I'm, I'm trying to get you back here. Hang on one more second. There we go. All right, so before we wrap this up, um, why don't we tell everybody where you can be found? Uh, we've been running your, your stuff on the lower thirds, but why don't you tell people your Twitter account, um, how to find you on any of the other places you want to be found, all that good stuff. Okay, so um, Twitter, if you all, if, you know, I'm always happy to talk to people on Twitter. I love Twitter, and I'm at um, MBR IT, Matt Baxter Rails IT there, or MBRIT. Um, I'm obviously got my blog on ZDNet, which is uh, www.zdnet.com forward slash blog forward slash post hyphen PC. Um, and my book, Death of the PC, you can find at theplatform.io. Really? Okay. Mm -hmm. Theplatform.io? Yep. T H E platform.io. That's the one. And it's done, or it will be done, and you can find it? Uh, it's, it's halfway through the first draft. So, um, yeah, it's going to be September, probably mid-September. Okay, so uh, if you're watching this after mid-September, that's where you can find that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Matt, I'm about to run the credits, but I want to thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Um, I've learned a lot, and I've had a lot to think about, and so uh, thank you very, very much. No, thank you. It's been great.